Well, welcome everybody. This is uh, Karsten Kouwer of uh, We Are Change. And uh, today we are talking to uh, Mr. Scott Tibbs from uh, originally yeah. from the uh, United States, yes. America. Yes. And um, he is also uh, representing uh, National Health National Federation. Federation. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Mr. Scott Tibbs, his expertise is health indeed. And uh, we have some uh, questions uh, for him uh, prepared. I'd be happy to answer them if yes, I can. Yes, very much. Thank you. Um, oh, first question. Um, this is about introduction. Um, uh, what is the National Health uh, Federation and how did it come into existence? It's the world's oldest health freedom organization for consumers. And it came into existence about uh, 56 years ago this month in 1955 by a group of really concerned citizens who saw their health rights, their health freedoms being taken away from them. So they banded together and formed this organization. And that was before my time. I wasn't involved at that time. But, uh, and they were very spectacularly successful. They were the only game in town. If, if you wanted to promote health freedom, you did it through the National Health Federation. Now, these days, you have many different organizations, but in those days, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you really had just one organization, it was the NHL. And since then, we've been fighting on many different fronts against vaccines, mandatory vaccinations, against water fluoridation, uh, against uh, just monopoly, uh, orthodox medical practice, uh, that is to allow the rights of alternative doc doctors to do what they do. <clears throat> and, um, and then also more recently on the Codex Alimentarius front, where we've been the only health freedom organization to achieve status, accredited status, at the Codex meetings. And this allows us uh, to speak out at the meetings and to submit written documents, arguing our positions, and to interact in real time with the other delegates if we want to. So it's a real good position to have. So that's basically it in a nutshell. We've done many, many different other things, but that's the NHL. Okay. And actually, I should say that's the old name. We still have the same name, but it's an international organization. So even though it says National Health Federation, mm -hmm. we have members in about 20 different countries and members on our board who are from other countries and our advisory board and then various uh, like NHF Sweden, NHF Germany, even NHF Benelux, NHF UK, NHF mm -hmm. uh, Ireland, and NHF Canada. Oh great, oh great. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, who supports and directs and funds the NHF? Uh, the Rockefeller. No, I'm <laughs> no, just the opposite. They don't like us at all. We're funded by just really the $36 that people donate to us, or for pay for membership, excuse me, it's not a donation. And uh, then some donations that come in, and then bequests when people die and they mention us in their will. And that's really it. That's how we do it. And then some of the money we've cleverly invested and made money off of. So we're doing okay, but uh, we need more members. We always need more members, and more income would help too. So, uh, but it's all from individual consumers. I mean, there are a few companies that here and there help us out, but it's always on a small scale operation when they do. Yeah. What what uh, what motivates you? What drives you to do all this uh, massive amount of work oh, and uh, going to all these congresses and uh, you know yeah. sitting through these endless meetings yeah. with the Codex Elementarius <laughs> and yeah. all these uh, stuff? What drives you? Oh, because I like to torture myself. <laughs> yeah. No, because I um, because I have a burning desire for freedom. And uh, that's really my motivation, and to make a difference. I don't care about making a lot of money, I care about making the difference. And it's also my upbringing, which was very uh, freedom-oriented. And then I also think it's something inside people as well. Mm -hmm. I would say it's a motivation to increase freedom in the world, yeah. bottom line. What are things that, that worry you these days? Well, probably the most worrisome thing is the increase in government and control of, over individual liberty, the, the diminishment, the elimination of individual freedom, and uh, the change in culture, actually. Mm -hmm. 
from one where people are honest and truthful and and uh, can be taken on their word to one where you can't rely on anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, really the diminishment of indi individual liberty. Mm -hmm. What is Codex Elementarius and what does it mean? Well, Codex Elementarius is just Latin for food code. And basically what it is, it's a international body, uh, ostensibly scientific body, that's meant to develop international food standards for adoption by various countries and, and use in international trade. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, uh, for use in international trade. And it's, uh, it's something that was created by, and I may be anticipating some of your own questions, but it was created by uh, basically two arms of the UN, of the United Nations, by the Food and Agriculture Organization by the World Health Organization back in the early 60s through a series of resolutions in 61 through 62 and 63. And it started then, but it was pretty small then, and it wasn't very well um, uh, thought of in terms of what it was doing, and, and <coughs> sorry, in terms of what it was doing and in terms of, um, of uh, its importance, I guess, mm -hmm. is really the word I was looking for. But it uh, gradually increased in mm -hmm. power and attendance by member countries mm -hmm. to the point that in uh, 1994, you had the World Trade Organization mm -hmm. being created. And what happened is then suddenly there were enforcement powers for these mm -hmm. guidelines that were being developed in different food areas. Mm -hmm. And the food areas were Areas like uh, anything from natural mineral waters to uh, fruits and vegetables to uh, vitamin supplements mm -hmm. to uh, contaminants in food mm -hmm. to food additives, that sort of thing. And they created a whole slew of committees, a whole group of committees mm -hmm. to do the work of the commission itself. To flesh each part out. Exactly. Yeah. That's very well put. Exactly. To flesh out the work or the intended work mm -hmm. of the Codex Elementarius Commission, mm -hmm. which meets once a year, usually alternately in Rome, which is the headquarters for the FAO, mm -hmm. the Food and Agriculture Organization, and in Geneva, which is the headquarters for the World Health Organization. And the FAO pays about 85% of the bill, the costs associated with Codex, and WHO is a little cheaper and only pays about 15%. And then various countries like the United States or the European Union uh, will contribute money on its on their own as well. Mm -hmm. Because I have also a question here, who founded and is funding the uh, Codex Elementarius okay. overtly and maybe also covertly, yeah. because usually there uh, the money goes through channels, basically. True. I think, I think in general it comes from the governments using other people's money. I mean, that's mm -hmm. basically it. Uh, so, the national governments are really funding it directly mm -hmm. or indirectly because they pay their dues to the United Nations, which then funds the FAO and the WHO, and then they pay money. And then there will be individual contributions, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, by the United States, by Canada, by the EU, uh, Norway, some other you know, countries or country groups like that. And that's where they get their money, really. Mm -hmm. from there. Yeah. Um, why is the Codex Elementarius uh, not good for humanity, in your opinion, and how will it impact uh, the lives of people? Well, I kind of need to answer that question by going back to what the two stated goals of Codex Elementarius are. They're actually two noble goals. The first is to facilitate interna international trade, that is to eliminate barriers to international trade. The second is to protect the consumer's health, the health of the consumer. Mm -hmm. So those are two goals that actually, how can you argue with that? But, mm -hmm. uh, it, so it's really not the goals themselves that are the problem, it's the implementation of it, it's the structure of it. And I wouldn't say that Codex Alimentarius per se mm -hmm. will hurt the health of, of uh, humanity. It's really more the way it's been grabbed onto and mm -hmm. controlled and being re 
directed away from its noble goals mm -hmm. to goals that aren't so healthy, mm -hmm. to goals that aren't so useful for humanity, mm -hmm. and that will actually end up hurting it rather yeah. than helping it. And if there is, I'm not saying that I'd be naive enough to believe that we can regain control and direct it the right way. Maybe we can, maybe we can't. We don't try to do that, mm -hmm. but rather what we try to do is either keep it from hurting people and to the extent it can do some good, then mm -hmm. we, we direct it in that way as well. Because I think within Codex Alimentarius, mm -hmm. you know, it's not some monolithic entity where they're all evil or they're all good. Mm -hmm. You know, there are good people in there, there are, I hesitate to say evil people, but people who aren't doing such good. And uh, I even have found throughout the years that there are staffers, Codex mm -hmm. staffers, that like what the National Health Federation mm -hmm. is doing there mm -hmm. and is, are actually helping us. Mm -hmm. So we have people who help us there. And then there's some country delegates, because mm -hmm. keep in mind that the people who attend these mm -hmm. Codex meetings, I mean, each Codex committee meeting, and there are some 27 different committees. Am I jumping ahead here, or should I no, just no. keep on going? I'd just go on. Okay. And, uh, there's some 27 different committees, and they're, each committee is hosted by a particular government, mm -hmm. like the Dutch government. Mm -hmm. The Dutch government is the host government for the Codex Committee on Contaminants in Food, called CCCF. Mm -hmm. And it meets once a year, usually in the Netherlands, but it could be a third world country sometimes. Like last year's meeting, the 2010 meeting, was held in Izmir in Turkey, and mm -hmm. I went to that. And it deals with contaminants in food. In this case, melamine was our big issue, uh, the NHF's issue, because this is a man-made contaminant. And I don't know how much you want me to go into detail, but it's one that's introduced into the food deliberately uh, or accidentally through deliberate use of the melamine. Mm -hmm. And yet it's very harmful to human health. And they wanted to establish levels of 2.5 parts per million mm -hmm. that would be okay for people to take. And we were the only ones at the meetings, the last two meetings, mm -hmm. one in, um, in Rotterdam before that, and mm -hmm. then Izmir this last year, and then in a couple of months, there will mm -hmm. be the next meeting, which will be in Den Haag, mm -hmm. and we'll go to that to argue once again that there should be zero tolerance for melamine yeah. because it's deliberately added. It's not something that's naturally present mm -hmm. in the environment. It's not something even like arsenic or lead mm -hmm. that's naturally present in the environment, and you will have you know, upper safe levels for it. Instead, it's something that's deliberately man-made, so mm -hmm. why should there be any limit? But the EU was the biggest pusher mm -hmm. uh, for having a 2.5 parts per, per million limit on it, mm -hmm. which is crazy. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the EU delegate even argued in favor of having exemptions to that 2.5 parts per million so that you could have even more mm -hmm. contamination. Okay. In now, some people could see it as like um, a stepping stone towards mm -hmm. higher levels and so yeah. on. That's what, yeah, that's a good what happens with laws. Yes, they just right. bring in a first uh, um, some slight um, penalty for something mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they upper the levels yeah. and stretch it out. Of that's right. Yeah, ab ab absolutely right. It's the foot, first foot in the door yeah. or camel's nose in the tent. <laughs> and then after that, the sky's the limit. Yeah. You know, they get people used to it. And then, and the thing that people forget here, and this is the argument that we made at the meeting, is that, or the meetings, is that melamine, sure, if melamine were the only contaminant in the world, then maybe they have a point. But it's not. There's melamine, there's uh, arsenic, there's lead, I've already mentioned as natural contaminants, mm -hmm. uh, there's aluminum, there's all sorts of things. And, there all are right. ways that these all interact that we don't even know today how they all interact mm -hmm. negatively. But they do, and they're cumulative. So they accumulate in your system, mm -hmm. and you're worse off. So even at low levels of mm -hmm. melamine, you add in all the other contaminants, and you're in trouble. Yeah. Uh, synergistic and cumulative, and definitely a danger. Yeah. And we see it a lot because a lot of these factors are endocrine disruptors. Mm -hmm. They're really xenoestrogens, most of them are, which turns basically men into women and women into men. So it makes mm -hmm. women more masculine mm -hmm. and it makes men more feminine. Mm -hmm. And that's what's good.